Hello, everybody. Um, thanks a million for coming along today. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to Sebastian about family history and his novels and how they play into each other. Uh, the brilliant Sebastian Barry has written. I, so I got this from Wikipedia, and I asked you, and you couldn't remember. I said, have you written 10 novels and 15 plays? And you said, I, I don't know. Well, Wikipedia knows. So he's written a lot of amazing stuff. Uh, he's written... Two books shortlisted for the Man Booker, uh, The Secret Scripture and A Long, Long Way. He won the Costa Prize twice, which is kind of unheard of for uh, The Secret Scripture and Days it of the It was a mistake, Inch. but I went with it. Yeah. Um, and he's just finished a three-year stint as the laureate for fiction, um, for which he did three amazing lectures, one of which was done last year kind of remotely, and it's called The Fog of Family, and it's a very powerful piece about family and fiction and the subject of what we're talking about today. So we're going to start with Sebastian reading a little bit from that. Yeah. And then we'll have a discussion and then we'll throw it out for some questions towards the end. Uh, so yeah. without further ado, okay. Sebastian Barry is going to... I'm going to stand up. Is that all right? Okay. Stand away. Um, yes, uh, I had the um, mysterious happiness, as it turned out, of reading the first two lectures or giving them, as they say, quite sure how you give a lecture, but uh, at the Gate Theatre, and where um, a play of mine, The Steward of, Christ Steward of Christendom, had played, and a later play, Our Lady of Sligo, with Sinead Cusack, the steward was with Donald McCann. So you can imagine my complicated happiness uh, giving the lectures there on the same stage where Donald McCann four feet away from me, had growled out his performance, and sometimes growled at some of the actors, which the audience can't hear, uh, when Kieran Ahern was reading the letter from the front, which is in the play, from Willie to his father, Donald would sometimes say under his breath to Kieran, hurry up! <laughs> which I don't know if that's inspiring or not, but perhaps I should hurry up now. Uh, but it was, this was the third lecture, which I had to do online, um, and it was recorded by my son, Toby, who is a maestro of these things, uh, in, our, in our little library at home. So I ha didn't have a chance to say it to living, breathing human beings. Yes, here we are, thank God. Um, so I just read the first few pages to, to, to give you a sense of it, because it will lead into what Patrick and I will talk about. So this is called The Fog of Family. This took three years to write. I was going to do it the first lecture, uh, and I just found it far too complicated because a lot of it is not saying things, which is something we specialize in in Irish families and possibly all other families. Uh, so it was very difficult to write a lecture about things never said. Uh, and here is how I resolved it as far as I could, anyway, for the first few pages. Here is a first memory or masquerading as one. It is of the bars of a cot, but not my own cot. It is in the old room of a hospital. I know where this hospital is, a Georgian building that still exists on Harcourt Street in Dublin. I remember tall windows and gloom and also that signature foggy bareness of childhood recollections. It may have been full of nameless medical clutter all the same. Indistinct, the fog blowing through everything. I am possibly one and a half years old. I must be walking in order for my sister to be able to push me down the front steps of our house as she has innocently done, causing me to break my nose. Then it duly healed and then she pushed me out a window. But it was the ground floor and it nearly served to break my nose again. My sister was not a murderer. She was a child consumed by a powerful emotion. For a year and a half, she had been the only child. Then the interloper arrived. The outcome was I began to speak through my nose in a, so far as I was speaking. A surgeon attempted to rectify it, hence the hospital cot. 
I am staring at the door into the ward, willing my mother to come back to me. I have no idea how long I have been waiting, minutes or hours or days. I am standing on the mattress and holding on to the bars, and I'm staring at the solid-looking dark space. The need in me for my mother to come is absolute. The door must be already open, but so positioned that a person entering will only be seen at the last moment in the frame. My eyes are so focused, the air is shifting and blurred as if with the smoke of a fire. In this memory, my mother never comes. I am willing her to appear, staring and staring. She never comes. She never comes. And then she did. The surgeon was working to clear the passageways of the nose, and he did, but inside things were still shattered, out of place. The most signal consequence of this deviated septum is I have been snoring like a walrus all my life. I knew nothing of that snoring version of myself till recently. Alas, there is an app for everything. Listening to a recording of what the app designates as epic snoring was not very Virgilian or Homeric. The person who lies at my side has had 35 years of it. How can you apologize for 35 years of concatenation? A voucher for Brown Thomas doesn't cut that mustard. <laughs> I did not know the snorer in myself, the snoring husband, just as I am sure I do not really know the writer in myself or the child, that fictional story-bound child. But maybe all you need is a vague sense of yourself. When I was a child and older, my father's snoring echoed through our old house on Longford Terrace, making it seem the four-foot-thick walls tremble. We feared to wake that slumbering colossus. We used to creep up the stairs to bed, the heavy mahogany treads creaking. I have it all joined in my mind with box cello suites, one of two records he owned, which also, which also used to reverberate through the house when it was being played on the gramophone. It was Pablo Casals as an old man, sawing his wife in two, eternally, with many an audible groan. And I suspect he snored to beat the band. All in all, despite the snoring, my father's not mine, I was having a happy childhood. A person can attempt to make an assessment of that right or wrong as he or she exits that demanding state of being. I loved my father. Even when I was a teenager, I relished his company in the mornings on the way into town to school in the Volkswagen hatchback, one of a dynastic series of such cars since infancy. I missed his company even as I enjoyed it. By the time I was in my early 30s, various family troubles had separated us permanently. I remember the first sand-colored Vokes arriving, second-hand, cheap maybe, but still coveted, pulling up to the pavement outside our flat on Leeson Park, where indeed my sister did the work on my nose. Through a sunlight so piercing, it was as good as a fog. Was I three? It must be a memory later than the hospital, so an even early memory than both of these was me smearing the contents of my nappy on the wall behind my cot, to the distress of my sister who shared the room. Maybe she had a motive for murder after all, but which my mother interpreted as an early sign of artistic ability. <laughs> Indeed, my grandfather, my father's father, who was a watercolorist of radiant ability, apprenticed me to him when I was about 11. He hoped by doing so that I would continue on from him. Every Saturday, I traipsed over to him after school. He always slept for an hour after lunch, so I would sit in his studio waiting for him, waiting for his tread on the stairs and the beginning of the miracle of watching him paint his hands like miniature ballet dancers, a deep silence in the house like a spaceship in space, the studio as composed as a painting with me, age 12, painted into it. Snoring, an activity we share, my father and I, the only one now separated as we have been for many years. So that kind of leads perfectly into the kind of subject of this discussion.
which is, um, I've been reading your stuff over the years, and I always knew it was an attempt to kind of understand Irish history, but I never quite, until I saw that lecture, understood the extent to which it was an attempt to uncover your own family history. Um, was that something you were aware of? Well, well, at a certain level, it strikes me now, uh, it, it's been an immensely self-interested uh, thing to do. I mean, although I, I, as laureate, I had the privilege of speaking to 18 of my fellow writers to try and find out what the hell it is we do do, I, 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 I still don't know. And, uh, and it was fun not knowing and finding out we, none of us knew. But um, if you ask me at the point of a gun, which, after all, is such a, an important part of Irish history, asking questions at the point of a gun, I, I just couldn't tell you exactly, and I'm quite content in a way not to be, not to be able to. Um, I think, in truth, there's a sort of ancient period for me before Ali and the babies, and then there's the aftermath of that, where I think there was a sea change. Uh, I used to say nobly um, enough that my novels were an attempt and a plays to establish a sense of a connection and Irishness for my children, because I felt that whatever sort of human person I was, I didn't seem to have the adjectives of Irishness as applied to people, say, after independence. I seemed to lack some crucial ones. So I was aiming to insert, and pro probably uselessly and certainly quietly, some new adjectives into the definitions of Irishness for the sake of my children, one of whom is sitting there disbelieving every word I'm saying. Um, and and that's, that was seemed like a noble project to me, but I suspect now that it was much more self-interested than that. I think these are survival mechanisms, and the truth of the matter is that uh, the sort of creature I am is only, like a fisherman or fisherwoman would only be happy standing at the side of the moy with the feeling that salmon were in the water, and I'm only really poised and complete, you might say, when I'm working at my table. So what arrives there is not immaterial, but, but, but it's certainly, um, you know, there's a happy accident about the whole thing. So in the, that lecture, the, the fog of family, you kind of talk about a lack of safety you felt as a kid and an unease, yeah. um, and how that feeds directly into your work. And what is fascinating and kind of unique about your work and again, idiotically, I'd read loads of your books before I realized how many of them, I think they are all in some way based on some ancestor or close family member. Uh, was that always the way they started? And why start with such well, close to home? The important thing is, you know, the, the title of this moment is called Reimagining Ancestry, but really it's Making Up Ancestry. Um, which is also something quite common uh, in Ireland. We, we want to, you know, we're... we're uh, I was going to say we're not comfortable with the idea of coming from nothing and from murderers, but actually uh, we're often quite proud of our murderers in Ireland and want to be descended from them. But uh, I just, yeah... Um, Sorry, what, what, what am I supposed to be saying? What did so I I'm fascinated with how you always started with like, yeah. like a snippet, a tantalizing Sh snippet that you knew well, that, about Sometimes that's history. all I have is a snippet. Yeah. And, and I have to make an entire Gansey out of two pieces of thread. And I'm much happier doing that. Um, in a book like The Temporary Gentleman, I know far too much. Yeah. And I have to try and forget everything. Uh, for Days Without End, uh, another of my novels, I just have the fact that my grandfather vaguely thought that his uncle had, or great uncle even, had been a soldier uh, at the American, in the American army in the 1850s and 60s. But that's all I had, and absolutely nothing more than that. In the secret scripture, I, my mother and I were driving in Sligo it, it's at Strand Hill, and she pointed to a hut, and she said, that's where your woman was put. This is, uh, in Ireland, when we say you're a woman, you know, if they, or you're a man, you know you're in deep trouble if you are that woman or a man. And, and she meant this great aunt of mine who had married my great uncle and had been kind of discarded by the family as unsuitable. So I was very interested in her. I didn't know her name. I didn't know much about her. I think she was the piano player in my great uncle's band. 
And uh, so I, I made this book out of those two things. Uh, and um, it entrances me that she was so real to the readers. So this, this is another question about uh, fact and reality and the reality of books. Uh, so much so that uh, some nurses in um, Roscommon had a new lecture hall. And they, they wrote to me and they said, can we call our lecture hall the Roseanne Clear or the Roseanne McNulty Lecture Hall? I mean, it just, it just overwhelmed me with happiness to think that this nameless person who had been erased, in fact, killed twice because not only did they commit her uh, in Sligo or Roscommon, but then they told the family not too long after that she died of TB. So this was a person cancelled twice. My suspicion was, my instinct was, that these outlaws, these people who we were told to disdain, oftentimes by societal things, sometimes by priestly things, are probably the most important people we have, and it behoves us to go back and find them again, even if there are no roads back, and even if there is nothing left to find. And that's what the, so this is why I describe what I do as rather mysterious and possibly ridiculous, because I'm claiming a sort of life for them. Uh, Richard Murphy has a beautiful poem about his grandmother, I think, and he says, may I retrieve her, it's an elegy for her, may I retrieve her from the cold hand where now she lies with a brief elegy. I mean, how wonderful a poet was Richard. Uh, and I, I would love to be able to do that, but my, my best work, my best adventure, I don't mean my best work critically, I just, my, my greatest adventures have been trying to find people whom you cannot find. Now, that's what it constitutes the journey for me in my workroom and the excitement that I get in the workroom sometimes. So when you do, like, in both those, the other in two of your Laureate lectures and also in the title of A Thousand Moons, there's this idea of the kind of circularity of history, that history is always there. It's not, the past is not the past. Is it like Faulkner's thing? It's not, yes. It's not dead. It's not even past. Yes. Like, is for you going into these things? Do you, did you always view it as historical fiction, or do you view it as something? Oh no! Kind of I, I, although I am the proud winner twice of the Walter Scott Prize for historical fiction, I I just don't feel. I I feel for me the present is much more distant than the past. So I don't know what, what that would make me as a contemporary novelist. Very confused, probably. <laughs> um, no, I don't feel that. I, I do think you can go... I, see, look, here we are, this mysterious creature who have, we've all been assailed by this fascistic virus in the last year and a half uh, that only wants the world for itself and to hell with everything we want to do. You know, I mean, it's very, very, very difficult um, to say where we are, what sort of creature we are. And the whole business of gathering a sense of that... Um, it is almost, is almost impossible, but you know we we just simply must do it. We must try and do that and position ourselves in the world and see what sort of how how we could define ourselves. The pandemic, actually, as I was kind of looking through your work over the last week, the pandemic is a very kind of Sebastian Barry type of subject. <laughs> like if it had happened thirty years ago, I can imagine a McNulty experiencing it fifty yeah. years ago. Well, it did happen in nineteen. Yeah. You know, I wrote a novel about the First World War, um, and after the war, when the Great Spanish Flu came, more people were killed by that than had been killed in the war. And yet, it's barely mentioned in the textbooks that I was looking at, and I asked my friend, Roy Foster, uh, is it in the literature of the history of the Civil War or the Irish War of Independence? I mean, hundreds of people died here in Ireland, and he said, no, it's never mentioned. And it's as if there was a desire not to mention it. Or you could understand, say, in cities like Philadelphia, where f many, many people died, whole streets were erased, that there was sim simply no one there to remember it. So it intrigues me, if I live long enough, to see how this is remembered, wh whether it will be remembered. So in terms of how family drives your work, right? on the one hand, it's obviously a source of starting points and material. And mm. uh, on, the, on the other hand, uh, you, you talk in the fog of family about how family kind of made, like the difficulties made you a writer. And I think you've said in an interview before, you, you echoed that idea that uh, an unhappy family is like 
the making of a writer. Is that how you see it? I, I, you know, it was interesting writing that lecture because I concluded various things for myself, having struggled to do it. That the details of our traumas, while are of ultimate import, are, are of complete importance to ourselves, as all all of us maybe are sort of survivors of childhood. Nevertheless, um, their details aren't important in a public sense. You don't need to be able to do an interview in the Sunday Independent or wherever and tell everyone what happened to you. The important part of it is that something happened to you and this is what made you a writer. As Cohen said, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Um, I think it's, um, it, if it's a profession raised out of a sort of inability to cope with trauma when you're a child, then, then perhaps it's a sad state of being, I don't know. But what I've loved about other writers is, uh, I'm thinking of Sinead Gleason here too, is people who have unfurled the banner of their own inner selves and used it as a sort of uh, weaponless um, uh, retrieval uh, uh, of, their, of the present moment. Uh, and I love that in people, no matter how they've been, the, the, the thing's been put up to them, no matter what they've been asked to bear, or even asked to bear when they couldn't even understand what they were being asked to bear, nevertheless, they come back as a writer to, to show their strange and inimitable courage in, in the face of the world. I mean, that is a very wonderful thing to me, and something that I noticed very closely when I, as laureate when I was doing my 18 podcast with fellow writers, uh, that I mentioned that, 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 that what was leaking off them, what was radiating from them was this, was this courage. And I thought, actually, I like being, uh, and I, mean, I hope they don't reject me because I like being part of this platoon, you know. We're in the trenches, but by God, the conversation is good, you know. So I think Sinead, Sinead's book is a really interesting one to mention because that is kind of nonfiction and memoir. And again, it feeds back into why you feel the need to kind of filter uh, the things you need to get off your chest through fiction. Like, why is that the drive for well, you? Well, usually because I don't have the luxury of fact. Yeah. And some, some well, well, if that's a luxury, it can be a burden too. But usually I, I'm not, I couldn't call it nonfiction because, you know, because I've made it up. Um, and I do think that the thing of making it up, you know, this thing you're beaten for as a child, You've made up that story, you're lying, you're lying, and then they beat you. You know, they, well, if you do it, if you lie well enough as an adult writer, they praise you for it. So uh, <laughs> that's very confusing, possibly. But yeah, uh, I, you know, that's what I, 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 I rest. See, there is, a, there is a, a renaissance of Irish nonfiction writing. Uh, you're included in that if I don't want to embarrass you in front of so many people uh, with your book. But, um, and that intrigues me. And actually, in writing the lectures, I felt, because I haven't done much work like that, I felt I had sneaked a little closer to you and Sinead and the other essay writers, They're sort of edging into your company. I, do, you, do, you, do you mind me being in the same room just for a minute? And, and that was a bit of an intriguing feeling, you know, being, being confined to fact. But of course, as I wrote the lectures, I realized, of course, these, this is all lies too, because this is just how I remember <laughs> it. And I've said it 10 times, and I've transmuted it, but you have to go with that. Well, that's that's, what else do you have? Yeah. There, there are no, there's no policeman to come and tell you this is completely wrong, except, of course, in my family, there are numbers of policemen. So the, the memoir th and the, the essay boom is really fascinating, because on the stage earlier today, Sinead, if she is still here, mentioned that... Um, you know, herself and Emily Pine had been talking about why there was so much essay writing. Mm. And they'd been asked in an event, and it was because there was so much unsaid, particularly around the lives of women and yeah. things like that. And I, and I kind of wonder, is, like, is what was happening in fiction in Ireland a kind of sublimation of all this desire to get this stuff out? And in recent years, there's suddenly been a change where, you know, you feel well, emboldened to write about your life. Well, the very, the very thing you think will bring you censure in Ireland now. I mean, maybe this is our victory as a country rather than any economic thing. Uh, when I wrote The Steward of Christendom in 96, which was about my great-grandfather, who was one of the superintendents of the, DM, of the Dublin Metropolitan Police before independence, I thought I was writing about a traitor and that if people knew I had this person in my family, they would condemn me in some way, as if you were related to Major Sir or somebody. 
Um, but what I found even then was uh, when you put such a person on stage and you say, behold a man, behold a person, a human being in history, mired in history as we all are, that a certain compassion can flow towards him. Um, I'm, Michael D. was here earlier, and we've been so lucky in our presidents. Mary Robinson came to the Steward of Christendom, and Donald McCann as he was playing the lead. Donald could be quite fierce, you know, and when an actor has finished an enormous role like that, he, he basically wants to get into his clothes and go and have a drink, but although he wasn't drinking alcohol at the time. Uh, even Lear gets to take a piss, he said to me, Donald, uh, uh, resentfully, but also lovingly. Uh, anyway, he was in his dressing room in his tattiest of dressing gowns. For some reason, great actors must wear the worst clothes you've ever seen. I mean, his leather jacket, I won't even, it was insanitary. But anyway, <laughs> uh, he was there, and she wasn't coming, uh, M Mary Robinson. Uh, he was, I suppose he thought maybe she was standing him up or hadn't liked the play or something. But eventually, she did arrive. Uh, back in the dressing room, and she said, Donald, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, she said, I was in the ladies, there was a huge queue, my mascara was everywhere, I had to, I was weeping so much, I had to fix the mascara, and Donald said, well, okay, that's okay, so, you know, <laughs> that's fine. The Irish president, I, we had disarrayed the mascara of the Irish president, which we can't do with Michael D, but we'll try and disarray him some other way. Um, I, I am fascinated as well by how all of your work, including the Steward of Christendom, is about these kind of one or two families, like the Duns and the McNulty's. Yeah. And I was curious if that was always the intention. Like, I, I got to throw out stupid references here, but yeah. Balzac did it. The yeah. Marvel Universe does it. Like, everything is connected. Yes. Why is that important to you? And do you see it all as one big work? I don't think it was important to me in that sense. My, my main sense as a writer has been uh, a profound wish, you know, j just to get away with it. Um, Seamus Heaney, when, he'd have a, when I'd have a play on, I'd meet him somewhere, he'd say, oh, you had a play, Sebastian. Did you get away with it? You know, like your Jesse James, <laughs> getting down to Mexico before Pat Garrett, or Billy the Kid. Or, yeah, um, so that's been, you know, my main feeling about it. There's a sort of grandeur in asking me what was important to me. What was important to me was breathing in and out, uh, not failing my, the goddess, which is my wife. You must <laughs> be leaving gifts at the feet of the goddess or you're doomed. Uh, and also surviving the, the beautiful gaze of my children, like, who the hell is this? Are we related to him? And all that. That was my main interest in life, I should say, for the last 30 years. Uh, and writing is, I mean, when I was writing The Secret Scripture, um, I, usually when I'm working on a book, Patrick, I, I think I am fairly certain about a third of the way in that it's no good, that another book is going to have to be written after this quite quickly to save the day and pay the rent, and that it's all, it's, this is truly nonsense. How did, why did I ever, uh, and, and, or else something else is happening when my mother uh, was, was dying in, in, uh, when I was writing The Secret Scripture, although that's not how she saw it. Uh, she thought she was going to live forever, and maybe she has. Uh, but uh, that whole process of going to the hospital, I mean, we are in some ways still a wonderfully medieval country, but I didn't, they don't tell you the details of the things you should be doing. I went into the hospital for the millionth time, and the, the nurse there, and she was from the Philippines, so how did she know this? But she said, you know, what you're supposed to do, uh, Mr. Barry, is take your mother's clothes and wash them, and then bring them back to the house. I said, but I lived three hours away. She said, no, no, this because there won't be one. I was wondering why my mother was in rags the whole time and, and, and washing her knickers in the sink. I thought that was a bit odd. But this is the reason that I was supposed to wash them. So this is what was happening. And I didn't. I went home, and I blessed that nurse. And I said, thank God somebody had the kindness to tell me where I'd been absent in my, in my knowledge. And, and I washed her clothes and do you know if you take your mother's clothes from the washing machine and you're folding them and she is this worshiper of Yeats and you think of those plays where they're always folding things and, and you're weeping like a fool on the floor and, and, and cursing yourself and bringing them back. That's what was happening to me as a person when I was writing this, 
the secret scripture. And when I, when I knew she was unwell, uh, I, in fact, I thought I would have to stop. But the book paid no heed to me or my mother or that brilliant nurse or anyone else and just demanded so floor space. When you look back at the books and you look back at them y years later, does all that stuff find its way into it? Or, and do you see something that was at work there that you weren't aware of in terms of, in terms of the kind of the overall story that's being told in those books? I, sometimes I'm a bit surprised. Sometimes I think actually Ali drugs me and she writes the books. Because <laughs> I'm not sure I really have it. When we did the first read through of the, on Blueberry Hill, this recent play with n great Niall Buggy and brilliant David Ganley, on the first read through, I thought this, I had finally dis, de, detached myself from the old family and, and now was devoted to the new family. And here was a play about two guys, nothing to do with me, in Mountjoy jail. One had killed the other person's mother. The other person had killed the other person's son. Nothing to do with me. And then I sat in the front and I thought, every memory this man, PJ, has, this ex-priest, is my childhood memories. I've given the, everything to this man. And the other guy is all my memories of uh, growing up in Monkstown and the Monkstown farm at the back of Monkstown and my friends. And I, I just hadn't realized that in attempting to get away, I had just brought everything with me. You know, like a native person in America who just packs everything up and drags the whole thing onto the next site. You, you Isn't that disgraceful, though, in a way? It's not disgraceful. <laughs> well, I'd go so far as to say it's, it's suspicious. Anyway. <laughs> So in the last two books, um, Days, uh, oh, I'm so Days of the End. Days of the End and A Thousand Days. Often called Endless Days, but that's written by somebody <laughs> else. Um, it feels like you're kind of going into a new kind of family. And, and we were talking before, mm. and you said that it's in, in the recent books, you can kind of see your current contemporary family coming in, as opposed yeah. to, even though it's still set yes. a long time ago, based on a relative a long time ago. That's because I think I've lived so long. I mean, I know, 66 seems quite old to me. Mind you, I knew I'd be 45 in 2000, and I thought, oh, that's the end of life right there. What will I do after that? Probably hobble along on a stick yeah. somewhere. Um, but, you know, at 66, you, you do, you've lived a little bit long. You're fairly fit and healthy. Your brain is reasonably clear. And maybe it's inevitable then that stuff that happened 30 years ago would start to creep in. But... What I found m magical about these last two books, I mean truly magical and unexpected, was that as I began to write Days Without End, my son, Tobias, came out at the age of 16. I mean, with great difficulty, even though he was saying the words to a very liberal, we hope, family. Uh, and somehow, both his distress at not being able to speak, and then his release, having spoken, uh, just... Uh, gave me the proper birds at the beginning of, uh, of the book. There's a scene at the beginning of that book where the two boys are dancing, dressed as girls for the miners. And uh, I remember seeing a photograph. This is very, like the day before I began, a photograph. And there's thousands of photographs of the American Civil War and that whole period, 1850s, 1860s. Not one of the Irish families, you know. And I, I seen these, uh, this photograph of these two boys dancing, dressed as girls. And I, I who knows the context? Uh, I didn't know. And I thought, could I put that in a book? Can you put that in a book? And the answer definitely was, no, you cannot. <laughs> I thought, well, I'm just going to do it anyway. Uh, and, uh, and that was because of Toby. Because I thought, if I can describe a period in history where to be gay, what had the name, the, the very words were uninvented. And there was a certain amount of safety in that. And where you could love your man or love your woman and not be um, interfered with by the prejudices and the, the, the cruel and violent and powerful uh, instruments of state and church. You know, that, that, that could be a wonderful thing, that you could make a kind of empathetic witch's prayer, you know, to describe a safe time and then create a safe time. I mean... Impossible, I know, unlikely to succeed, but that's this kind of ridiculous thing that, that preoccupies me in my workroom. And then with A Thousand Moons, I had been privileged to observe the childhoods, not only of my two sons, but of my daughter. 
And here we are in supposed 2021. Why we always think modernity is ahead of other times, I do not know, because you just have to read history to find out that's not true. But I had witnessed the, I'd almost risk saying the ordinary but necessary courage of my daughter just to deal with the world as we have constructed it for her and for all other young women. And I thought, is it not my duty as a fairly stupid, straight, old, white, Irish writer to try and get a hold of this thing, to describe this courage in some way? And the only way I could do it was by transposing all that, as it were, back to the 1860s, 70s, in A Thousand Moons, to Winona. But of course, as I was attempting to say earlier, a Thousand Moons is, is essentially 83 years, which was a pretty good run if you can get it. She believes that, or her mother told her, that if you travel far enough along the circle of time, you will get back to the people you love. Now, the danger with that is you might get back to some people you didn't love, but anyway, maybe you can go around them and avoid them. Um, so this was, you know, this was... This is, a, this is this description of time that makes me feel that it is possible as a writer not to write an historical novel fully to answer your other question, but, or, but to actually get back into the moment and write it not, not as um, an historical thing at all, but as a thing still in the present. And I, I think elsewhere I tried to describe Einstein's description of time, where, where he says, we don't, require, we don't have enough senses to understand time properly. We think of it as a narrative uh, sequence of events, but that isn't so, he said. All things are happening always, everywhere, um, so that you just have to try and get the door to that other moment uh, to, for it to be contempor contemporaneous with your own. I mean, that's a very thrilling idea, but it all strikes me, if there is no such thing as narrative time, then, then what price fiction? I don't know. I, I don't know how you'd write that sort of fiction, although I think Claire Louise Bennett has had a damn good try in her recent book um, at, at doing that. Because I think the, those two books in particular feel like um, a kind of new phase in terms, of, like they're very much dealing with, like you said, yeah. the issues of your children's generation, albeit in a historical yeah. context. And also, um, by the see, start... See, I was getting so old, I thought I had to start again. I thought, I'm just, I don't want to be 66. I'll go back and be 22 again and start all over. You yeah. know, that's really what the impulse was. The other thing um, I wanted to ask you about is I really enjoy your action scenes. And I was curious, and it's such a strange thing in literary novels to read, like I think at the start of The Temporary Gentleman, there's like a boat uh, being torpedoed and it's pretty visceral. Right through um, your most recent two books, there are gunfights, there are yeah. pretty, very poetically rendered, I but I can see, like, is that? How strange that, you, that you'd that you end up, uh, write, you know, in the early old days, in, uh, writing cowboys. Yeah. I mean, this, I don't know anyone remembers or wherever, was ever a child in Don Leary with the Adelphi cinema still running, and you'd go in on a Saturday and sit in the, one in Thropody seats. You'd be herded in, all the children of Don Leary, girls and boys, herded into this tiny space in the balcony. I don't know why they did that. Maybe they thought we were, would go wild if they let us sit anywhere we wanted. And we'd watch all the films, which were mostly cowboy films. And I had no idea that that was going to be actually a seminal literary influence on me. I mean, you wouldn't even want it in a way. But, uh, but so it has transpired, which again, yeah. I think is pretty suspect. But we won't into it. I know you don't like the criminality of, of this conversation. <laughs> but, uh, I, I think it's very curious. I mean, so much so that the wonderful Tessa Ross is now making arrangements to make films of those two books. I mean, I can't tell you how, how, how overwhelming that idea is You've to have cowboy two, films. two cowboy films. I mean, if I could just go back and tell that boy, hold on, there's two really good cowboy films coming. It's just you have to live for 60 years. <laughs> so it, uh, in an interview, I think with John Self in the Irish Times last year, you talked about um, how you kind of been really enjoying plot and how for a long time plot was kind of suspect in literary. Well, visited by plot. Yeah. We were told, we were told, weren't we? my generation, postmodernists, or we thought we were modernists, actually, because the news hadn't reached Ireland that there was this post thing. Uh, so we were 
okay, everything has to be, it's all about styles, all about your signature of sentence, nothing should happen, probably not a, too much emotion, everything rather severe uh, because of all the wars and everything, and very understandable, the Shoah and the Civil War and the S Spanish Civil War, and, and that's what we were supposed to be. But I in a way, it wasn't what I was. And even when I was quite young in my 20s, trying desperately to write in the tradition of modernism, I wrote a book called The Engine of Owlite, which Aidan Higgins, of course, praised to the skies because he thought, at last, some person as foolish as me continuing modernism. And, and that was my uh, effort, I suppose. But I knew that there was something else. And then it was required, and I realized that, you know, you, what you have to do as a writer is find your own bird song. And it really doesn't matter what bush it's in or what sort of bird you are. It just has to be your bird song. And the, the struggle ever after that was to find something that was proper to me in that beautiful sense of the Latin word proprius, that actually belonged to me. And even if that was a small thing, or a disreputable thing, or a useless thing, it was your thing. And not to be dressing yourself in the clothes and feathers of other writers. Because of course, when you're 21, living in Paris in a Charme de Bon as I was, you're going down to the British Library, God bless the British Library, to get the, the letters of Joyce and Yeats, and you're reading them in your bed, and you're, you had the same headaches probably Joyce had from his <laughs> affairs and his money problems, my God. And you think you're somehow connected to them, and that if you met them in the, in the Jardin de Luxembourg, they'd throw their arms around you, mon semblable, mon frère. But no, it's not like that, you see. You're it's sort of on your own in an interesting way. And you have to make your own stand and find your own a bear's cave to write in and make your own books. And that's the struggle uh, for all writers, young or old. And, you know, I was being a bit facetious about going back to being 22, but actually, if you don't return yourself to that state of being in the Chambre de Bonne and, st and starting for the first time, you're in sort of trouble of a different sort. Ever for a moment, when you talk about laureates and the cost of the book of the year, thank God, you, I, I, I struck the mortgage off the books. I went into the Bank of Ireland with me, cost of the book of the year, and I said, takes X amount off me mortgage. <laughs> it was a wonderful moment, but it's not actually the thing that you're doing. The thing that you're doing is much more primal. The thing that you're doing as a writer is much more allied to the things we find completely mysterious. A Proxima Centauri, you know, it's the nearest planet we've never seen and we don't know what's going on. It's like that. It's not, yeah. you can't actually describe it because you can't reach the place where that explanation will be given. It's too far away. So in the context of that private working away in a cave, how have you found being the laureate and being a public writer, which is kind of what your role is? No person. No person on Earth. I mean, considering that in Ireland at the moment, at a rough estimation, we have at least 30 people who would be supremely good laureates and would honor the, the role and just be wonderful and whose work is world class. I mean, that's an amazing thing to say in itself. But I knew that no one of this group, if even I belonged in it, no one less suitable to be laureate than me. Because, because <laughs> well, it's just, it's, thank you, thank you so much. It, it's a psychiatric matter. I mean, you're, <laughs> You're, you're struggling just to, br to live, to breathe in and out, to, to present a reasonably human face to your family. You're, you're, you're trying not to be overwhelmed by the troubles of the older generation, these things visited on you and all these problems. Uh, you know, you just, you're just trying to get by, scraping by. And I thought, now I have to be a laureate. I have to does that mean I have to actually go out and see people? Or <laughs> do you have to meet anyone? Or can I just stay at home and be Laurie? No, no. And you have to create a program. And it was all very daunting and overwhelming. I had two amazing people, Sarah Bannon, Marcella Bannon. One letter different in their names, but sisters for all that, who helped me. And that, that really, they made that laureateship uh, between them. Uh, and they, create, they saw this poor dejected Heckin cart horse You're coming up some to be lying. Of and they turned me into a polo pony before they were finished. <laughs> I swear to God they did. Because then I actually loved it because I was released. I am wearing my cloak of invisibility as laureate or was. So your true self is not the thing you're traveling with exactly. It's, it's, it, when you go into the Central Mental Hospital to talk to that group, 40 people, bring your book club as a laureate to 40 people 
who are, in, uh, who are not guilty by reason of insanity, who may or may not have done some pretty startling things. And yet, when you come in as laureate, they stand up to in this desolate hall with the city, uh, Dundrum outside, with the cars and everything, and they make speeches. One woman said, she said, no one knows we're here. And if they did, they wouldn't come to see us. But you have come. And I don't know whether I felt like Michael D. Higgins crossed with Harry Potter or something. Like I had gained a new, literally like a Yeatsian mask or, a, or, or, or maybe, you know, better than and the mask and the beano of the guy who's robbing the bank. And, and I was concealed. And yet I was, my heart is, was blown open by it, as Seamus Heaney would say. And, and I was so thrilled to be in their company. Uh, and people said things to me that gave me bits of books then, you know. I mean, that's the other thing. If you neglect to go out among your fellow creature, you're not receiving the important piece of information they had to tell you, without which you couldn't write page 97. And you did lots of work as laureate with kind of marginalized groups, people in direct provision. Well, marginalized groups. The original idea was I would go to people who couldn't come to me. Yeah. But sure, a year and a half ago, that was suddenly the whole world. You know, no one could come to you, and I couldn't go to anyone. Did being laureate change your sense of either yourself or yourself as a writer, or what a writer's job is? It, it's an interesting, you know, Anne Anne Wright, who was the first laureate, and, uh, and inconveniently for me, you know, knocked it out of the ballpark. She did such a great job. She said it's half an honor and half a job. And the only time I'd ever disagree with Anne would be on that. I, I didn't feel it as a job. I felt it was, um, it was a sort of alchemical demand being made on me. I was being asked to transmute formally private, possibly even disused parts of myself, you know, the sheds and the stables and of an old house that nobody needs anymore, or, or all the farms of Wicklow with those wonderful buildings. And I was going to be reconstituted in order to be able to do this. Um, I, you know, I was talking about presidents earlier. I was all very moved by Michael D. for obvious reasons. He's a wonderful president, and he put the medal on my, around my neck. And I said, "What I want to do, Michael, is go out and talk to people that I feel are like writers, the people who are in rooms and can't get out. Writers." And he said, "Yeah, yeah, yes." He said, "I've done a lot of that work myself." I said, "Why is the country sometimes?" because he's the great minister for the arts, so, so poorly organized for artists. Uh, you know, people don't understand that young artists make n no money. When you say you make no money as a young writer, they think you mean 30,000 a year now. But actually, you mean zero. And yet, you're a respected writer. And I said, you know, Michael, sometimes I think, Michael, we need a revolution. And just for a moment, his face opened with the possibility I, and then, oh no, sorry, I'm president of this. <laughs> you know, it was just we were both going to g dig out the old I guns. And, no. Uh, you know, it was that, that's where it started in that moment with Michael talking about what he had done already, you know. And I, I just felt uh, in cahoots. And, and the, do you know, if we're all in our moments of honesty in our private minds, when we're, you know, uh, whatever, in the shower or cooking the rashers. Sometimes you think, you know, I haven't really stepped up to the plate of my life or I haven't fulfilled the things I wanted to do or be. And, and I've always had that feeling. But somehow the laureateship, somebody has, you know, Paul Muldoon rang up to say, I'm the laureate. I mean, I, I didn't even know he knew how to use a telephone. <laughs> <laughs> Do gods use the telephone? Why didn't he just beam it? Into my, anyway, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was uh, absurdly wonderful. Uh, and uh, th yes, what it gave me, it's just three and a half years of, of a sort of strange sense of comradeship with my fellow citizens and also a strange sense of conferred citizen citizenship from them to me, not by a government saying, because you know, we went to the direct provision, one of the direct provision in Clonakilty, and there was a woman there from Ghana, I think, who was a very distinguished lawyer in her own country. 
and they'd had her in this place for five years. Why couldn't this God work in Ireland? Excuse me. Or, or Malata Uche Okari, whom I did a podcast with, seven years in a direct vision center with her boy. And she, she, she's finally released out into the world, and then she has 17 PhDs and is a brilliant writer. In other words, obviously a person of incredible and infinite worth. What is wrong with civil servants that they can't see that the first day? Uh, Amen. <laughs> um, I'm sure people have loads of questions. So if you, there's a roving mic. So if anyone who has a question puts their hand up, we can I go on. Do you mind if I stand up again? I, no, go I'm, ahead, please. As an old theatre man, I'm afraid of sight lines. Sebastian, yes. this, this is not, I mean, I totally agree with what you're saying about the direct provision, and I hope there's going to be a change, and I also hope that there, people like, and all of us, need to stand up to what I will call the uncivil servants, and demand, now they're going on a four day week, they're being paid, they never answer their phone, but this is, that's kind of me being, you know, political. Um, but I want to ask you why you said you didn't know why Paul or how or think that Paul Muldoon could use a phone. Well, I'm I, just, I'm just I better clarify that because he is a dear <laughs> friend. I just thought, you know, it's the same moment happened to me when Michael Long, when A Long Long Way was being published at the Galway Festival. Michael Longley. Uh, quite liked the book, and he came down to help launch it and read some poems. And I just thought, Homer is launching my novel. Uh, how does he travel? Does he actually use a car? Or... It's that feeling about people like Muldoon, and Seamus too. And, and Seamus, you know, in my life, would actually appear. I never saw him in transit. Um, never saw him actually in a car or on a train. He'd be at one of my plays, and the lights would come up in a certain way, maybe prayers of Shark, and, and shine through his hair. And this halo <laughs> of hair would be there. So there's definitely something in what I say. Um, I describe elsewhere, I think it was Frank O'Connor going to the Abbey to see a play of Yeats's. There was absolutely nobody in the theatre, um, which is a bit of a thing with Yeats plays for some reason. My mother hated that. She loved Yeats plays. But anyway, there was only one person in the audience beside Frank, and he was at the front row, and he was staring up enraptured, and the light was shining through his hair, and he, it was Yeats, of course, at his own play. <laughs> I thought it was rather brave. I mean, I thought it was rather wonderful that he hadn't bothered to sit at the back or anything, and it couldn't see the empty seats with his play. Yeah. But these, yes, I mean, they are other poetry to me, which I tried desperately, wanted to be a poet, is the highest art because it is the, the furthest planet away of all the, uh, all the arts. This is my feeling about poetry. I, you know, I, I was privileged, I wrote about in some of the lectures, Michael Hartnett, who was a little wren of a man. Do you remember the old farthings with the wren on it? Yeah. He was like that. He was like you could spend him as a child in a shop and get sweets for him. He was so wonderful. I mean, he was, again, magical, otherworldly. Um, so that, that's the answer to your lovely question. I like the political bit of it as well. I feel an urge to defend public servants because there's so many in my family. <laughs> but otherwise, <laughs> is there any other questions? Thank you for that. Hello there. Um, Hi. We read one of your books in our book club. It, it was Days Without End. That, and um, our observation was you the about the characters around your son, that it was such perfection that you didn't explain anything. And it wasn't until we got to the end of the book that we realized you didn't have to explain this relationship. You know, we're so used to having to have a story to explain something to yourself if someone says something to you, that this book was such a gift. We felt, we just wanted to say that to you, that we felt it was such a gift to your son. We'd all love to be able to give our children something like that, something without explanation that their lives can just be what they are, you know. That's what we felt after reading well, that. Well, that's beautiful. You know? Although I felt he had given the gift to me. Of course, He had you given know. me the book. Yeah, but there was sure. a sense of gifting in yeah. that. In fact, um, when the Lakota would have great gatherings uh, regularly, 
a large part of that gathering was giving gifts, sometimes very extravagant gifts to each other, sometimes to, that would actually impoverish you and your, your group of people you know, for months ahead. The, the feeling was to give generous gifts was the ultimate good. Um, and I mean, the gifting of things, do you know, I, I never met Joseph Conrad, obviously, who, of course, incidentally, never gave an interview in his life, nor ever had the privilege of doing an event like this. But, you know, the sense of comradeship with him and what he gave me as that boy of 22 in, in the Charme de Bon, his books and an understanding of him. You know, that we, I'm just thinking uh, on my feet here in response to your question, that there is a sense of gifting. And if you refuse those gifts um, or only choose certain gifts, I, I won't have these chocolates, but I'll have these ones. You know, and the person who's giving you the chocolate, oh, thanks a lot. You know, you've chosen, um, then, then you're in, you can get yourself into trouble as a writer, which is allied to what I was saying earlier about, um, you know, what, are your, what is your subject matter? Your subject matter is not connected to your, to your status. Uh, this is the, the whole thing. You're, you're, like I say, you're working away to try and stay alive and maybe even improve yourself a little bit because you see you're in dire need of improving. And then there's this other world that is actually building you a little pedestal. And the, the great thing about, I mean, the obvious thing about pedestals, pedestals is they're perfect for falling off, you know. So you just have to keep, yeah. But that's lovely. I mean, book clubs, that, that didn't exist. I mean, if it did, it must have been quite rare. But 40 or 50 years ago, there was no such thing. And that's why I was so inspired by being at a particular book club. It was one in London with Miranda Richardson, Chrissy Hines, um, and all these people. I, again, I hadn't seen them taking public transport. Uh, but, but Chrissy Hines, I mean... Even if she hated the book, I would have been happy, you know. Um, so I, that's why I, 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 part of the laureateship was to bring the book club to people who couldn't come to me. Uh, that's why I wasn't doing ordinary, you know, vibrant book clubs, maybe like your own, where you're meeting in freedom and, well, you were at one point meeting in freedom. Uh, so that was very inspiring, the idea of book clubs. I think we have time for one or two more questions. If any hands go up, there's one back there. This is the first public event I've done, well, everyone's done, in a year and a half. It's such a privilege. Thank you so much for coming before we even go. Thank you so much um, for existing, <laughs> for living this long. We do exist. The public does exist to other people. Um, I'm just interested in what you were saying about trauma. Yes. And, you know, writing from that. And as you were talking, I was just... This is just my aside. Mm. I was just kind of thinking to myself, my God, I could write a book too. Sebastian mm -hmm. Barry can do that, and he goes to cowboy movies when he's a child, and etc. But anyway, the thing is, I just wanted to ask about um, the trauma thing is, do you have a sense of, in this modern world that you're living in, we're living in, of you know the intergenerational movement, say, in terms of your own family and your own experience of trauma? Is that something um, that you try to bring in in some way in your books or something you pay attention to? Well, um, the great, you know, the great res resolution. No, that's a great sort. question, and I'm almost not equal to answering it. But, uh, you know, the, the conventional idea, or the idea we were told blithely, was that the world is always improving, especially in the 60s. Well, it was disimproving for a large number of people. Um, but it seems to me. It seems to me, just as a casual reader, if endless reader of history, that it is not so. Nothing is improving. In fact, we're being told now that everything is definitely, officially disimproving. Uh, you know, and in fact, our traumas won't even have a place to happen uh, in, in a number of decades. So what price trauma? Uh, but I do think, just as the creature I am, that... Um, that the job or the job description, I don't know what the job description of the laureate is, but I know the job description of the parent is to create 
as much as you can within whatever is in your power, a safe place for your children, a site of safety. Um, one of the reasons I did write A Thousand Moons was because I realized that wasn't absolutely 100% achievable. But I did think that there was a generation in the 60s and the 50s who were interesting in their own way. They, their god was Sartre, l'être et le néant, being and nothingness. Uh, love was dead, history was dead, uh, because there'd been so much of it. Surely it's over now. And you know, very great artists came out of that. My mother was a very famous actress um, and a very wonderful actress. My father was a young poet. But if you think like that, then nothing is important enough to make it safe. Like children, I'm generalizing in a way because I hope I'm not the only one, but children as such in Ireland in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s weren't very important creatures. And if you were a poor child, you had no importance. In fact, anyone could do anything they liked to you. What, what, what trauma does is it, 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 it inhabits. It's like a flock of sparrows. It comes in and it's in a garden for a while. Flies up, goes to another garden, and you think, oh, there's no trauma here. But it's in another garden. So that's why I say I don't think there's any improvement. But just for your own self, for your own decision-making as a human being, the one thing you can do even if you fail at it, but you're trying to do it, is to create this safety for your children. Because I saw it with my own eyes as a little boy, lack of safety. At the same time, when my sister and myself were put down with our great aunt Annie in Kiltegan or in Kelsha Beg, in, at the back of Kiltegan, this was a woman I tried to write about in, in Annie Dunn, that novel. This was a woman with a hunchback who was considered unmarriageable, therefore, like it was contagious. In fact, she'd had polio as a little girl. This beautiful woman, 59, she said, in fact, she had shaved 13 years off her age, uh, I found out, on her birth cert for some reason. So like, um, you know, like Joan Collins, she decided to be younger than she really was. Grand. Uh, she was, to us, like the connoisseur of mothering. She made us safe. She did the very thing that should have been naturally done for us. And for six or seven months in that little subsistence farm in Wicklow, myself and my sister were as safe as cottages, because we lived in a cottage, not a house. Uh, it was a place of 6 a.m., get up in the morning, Everything had to be cleaned, the, the butter had to be made, the hens had to be fed, the cricket had to be listened to in the hearth. I mean, it was a different world. It was a poor world, but it was a safe world. So in a way, that was my template as a father later on. And when, it, it, for instance, in 20, 2002, when, when, one of my, my, when my brother became unwell, I wrote that book. He's 13 years younger than me, strange enough, the same years that she had sawn off her age. I wrote that book to show him, having, he was having a psychiatric meltdown, what safety was, as a sort, again, as a sort of spell, do you know, as a sort of poor wizard spell. There, there are various gradations of wizardry, and I fear, you know, we're down here, but you're still, that's what you've been given to do, uh, try and do. Um, it doesn't make trauma either come back into your garden, fly out. To, you know, it doesn't affect the quotient of trauma in the world. And we only have to wake up in the morning and listen to CNN to realize the total truth of that. But just for a moment in, in this, things happening always, everywhere, in Einstein's sense of time, that there is a moment in this universal everything where your child felt safe for, do you know, 
whatever it is, 15 years of their life. What a victory. And what a freedom. Always in this country, all the history of our country is about the gaining of Irish freedom. We haven't even got close to that until we are conferring freedom on other people, not on ourselves. Do you know, freedom is, no, is, is, a, is a luxury, but if you give it away, you know, it's, 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 it's suddenly a, a much more universal and democratic thing. I'm thinking of that amazing woman from Ghana down in Vision, Direct Provision Center. I'm thinking of the people in Central Mental Hospital. I'm thinking of, of everyone who needs our assistance. I'm thinking of the traveler community. Uh, Owen de Vradunes has written this amazing book of traveler uh, myths retold by him in this brilliant book. Um, she, she, again, you see, in Ireland when we've disadvantaged people, in fact, even in colonial times when we as a population were disadvantaged, what you do with a population like that is you put them in rags. You impoverish them and then you blame them for being in rags and impoverished. You, you've done it to them. So we as a people, this is my private feeling, which I'm expressing here to you because I'm half in love with the, the fact that you exist at all. Um, <laughs> you know, we, it, 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 it is our job not to have these things happening in our time, in this part of the universe. Uh, that's... Thanks a million, everyone, for coming here. And thanks a million, Sebastian. That was brilliant. And it is lovely seeing a crowd of people. Okay.